Ben Young. How you doing? I, I do this with Toby. <laughs> I know, we just keep seeing each other. Me and you will do some catch up after this. Hello and welcome tonight. <clears throat> Hello and welcome to tonight's meeting of Hand Eye Supply Curiosity Club. I'm your host, Will Lacoma, a fabricator and machinist, and our audio visual, visual coordinator for this evening is Tobias Berblinger, an industrial designer and musician. Together we have a number of curious and exciting topics to share with you. Our series highlights an eclectic group of speakers, experiences, and workshops across a broad range of subjects dictated by our curatorial interests in the areas of culture design, science, technology, art, fabrication, and design techniques, and lost common knowledge. As, attendee, as attendees of the Hand-Eye Supply Curiosity Club, you are now all members provided you adhere to our philosophy. Ex curiositas scientia. We pledge to learn without prejudice in pursuit of our mutual goal, perpetual noviceship. We admit that it is impossible to know everything about anything, and thus we remain perpetual, perpetually curious and perpetually novice. This is our flag and our mascot, Franklin. The lightning bolt represents the receipt of knowledge, the enlightenment of illumination, the, res <clears throat> the resonance of truths understood. It awakens and excites us and makes us hungry for more. I am pleased to introduce our speaker, industrial designer, Nathan Berge. Nathan Berge is a volunteer rocket scientist for Portland State Aerospace Society. PSAS is a student community-run aerospace engineering group that is building ultra-low-cost, open-source rockets that feature the most sophisticated avionics systems of any similar group in the world. Thank you. Thanks. Um, hi, I am, I'm Nathan, or just Nate if you want, and I consider myself a rocket scientist. Um, I've been working with Portland State for a few years and we actually build rockets and launch them in the desert in Eastern Oregon and it's a really fun story about how we got to be where we are and we're also an open group it's not just students I'm actually not a student at PSU and never was uh, we're, we'd love to have people come by and check out the group and see if there's anything that you want to help with or if you want to come watch launches so far all of our launches have been open to the public I'm just not necessarily well known but um, first, I'll talk a little bit about why we want to do rocket science. And kind of the obvious answer is, is because it's rocket science. It's about the coolest thing there is. I mean, every five-year-old kid knows this. Um, this is uh, Ares X-1. It's a rocket launched by NASA fairly recently, although probably will never be launched again because of funding issues. But, I mean, this is the sort of thing you see at a big launch. This vehicle is enormous. It's hundreds of feet high. The flame coming out of it continues you know for hundreds of feet after it burning at thousands of degrees I mean everything about it the light the sound I mean rockets are just awesome so it's definitely an element of fun uh, to what we do there's a little bit of practicality I mean space is where you want to go in a rocket you can fly rockets around close to the earth and so far that's all our group's been able to do but eventually this is where we want to be this is actually a picture from the command module of Apollo 11 of Earth coming back in. And um, space is really the last frontier. We've explored most of the surface of the Earth. There's still some really great science to be done in all kinds of places, at the bottom of the ocean and edges of continents. But, um, you know, you just have to get out there at some point. I mean, if we never do, we're stuck here forever, and you never know what will happen. I mean, there's asteroids, there's all kinds of things. Carl Sagan has a lot to say about that, actually. Um, there is a problem, though. Rocket science is kind of hard. At least it can be if you're trying to go to space. Uh, this is a picture of an amateur rocket launch in the desert. Um, not sure which one. And it's what we call a catastrophe at takeoff, or Cato. Uh, what happened is it was a really big motor, and the forward enclosure of the motor up towards the top of the rocket uh, failed, the O-rings probably uh, melted or the casing melted through and you had a complete loss of the vehicle. And these things, sort of things happen and um, it's kind of interesting. I think one of my favorite quotes, which I don't really have memorized but I can paraphrase, is uh, from a guy who wrote computer software most of his life, actually is famous for writing the video games Doom in the 
he decided that he wanted to do rocket science a few years ago, and he thought, well, this is easy, or this is simple. You know, you have a, kind of a tube, and you fire at one end, you plug off one end, you kind of steer it, and it's 3D, and I, I can program 3D, I do this all the time. So he went about doing that, and he was trying to win some of the uh, prizes that NASA had at the time, and he almost got there, didn't quite make it, so the engines didn't start, some weird thing he hadn't thought of, and then a the year later, he had tried again, a year later, tried again, so like three years of work later, he managed to do this one simple task, which was to li launch a rocket, move move it over about 90 feet and have it land again in a minute or something like that. And he, his press response, or his press uh, release or whatever, after the uh, success, he said that it turns out the rocket science is still simple. It's, it's not complicated. All the things I thought at the beginning were true, but it is hard. You know, where I thought it was easy, uh, the engineering is actually difficult. And the problem is you're always pushing the envelopes to get it to get the amount of uh, energy that you need out of the rockets. And when you push envelopes in design, you tend to break them the first few times, or sometimes you just keep breaking them. And so that's really the problem. So most of rocket science is actually pretty simple to understand. It really is a tube with fuel in it that's plugged at one end. Uh, the question is getting it to work perfectly. And so why do you need it to work perfectly? Is because we're trying to go to space, and not just to space and back. We really want to get into an orbit. And this is this is actually really important to understand because there's a difference between tossing a rocket up 100 kilometers or 1,000 kilometers or a million kilometers and then tossing it into a big circle around the Earth that it will stay in. Because if you don't get to orbit, if you just go up, um, you'll still fall back down. The astronauts are floating around on the space station. They actually still have as much gravity as there is on the Earth's surface. They're only a few percent less. Uh, the reason everything's floating is, is it's all orbiting the Earth at the same acceleration around the Earth, and so everything is moving relative to each other the same way. It floats around, but there's lots of gravity up there. If you weren't moving uh, fast enough and you let something go, it would fall down just like here. So up isn't good enough. You have to go over. And in fact, that turns out to be the biggest problem. In low Earth orbit, and this, by the way, is uh, not to scale, if you're actually in low Earth orbit, you would be just barely above the surface of the line of the diagram of the Earth there. But to point out, if you, you have to have this nice big circle, your velocity component, um, or how fast you're going through the circle, is about 17,500 miles an hour to sustain the orbit, to not fall back into the Earth. Um, and that's just a consequence of the mass of the Earth and, and universal, gravel, universal, universal gravity. Uh, it turns out that the lifting part of the rocket, the going up to space, only is maybe 10% of the total energy. It all comes from having to, to take a mass and accelerate it to what's basically Mach 23, 17,500 miles an hour. So if you imagine one kilogram, or you know, two pounds or something, uh, it's a little thing, let's say you want to put a big rocket on it, how much energy would you have to put into that rocket to lift that kilogram in orbit? It turns out to be about, what, 32 megajoules, which is the same as the kinetic energy of a freight train at about 34 miles an hour. So imagine the freight train hitting something, coming to a stop, the release of that much energy is uh, this is about the same, and, or it's 155 pounds of TNT, which is a really big bomb. Uh, if any of you guys like to bike and even bike pretty fast and you think you're a pretty good racer, you can probably do about 210 watts sustained power on a bicycle. So if you kept that up for almost two days, a uh, day, 19 hours constantly, that might be enough energy for just a kilogram in orbit. So it's pretty tough to do, and because you have to be really precise like that, or uh, really, uh, get your energy just right, you have to be precise and you get there. So this is why I mean the difference. What we do so far and what everything except NASA and just now SpaceX and a couple other nation states does are what I call sounding rockets. And I actually don't remember what the origin of the term was, but basically they're just little rockets. They go up and they fall back down. Um, they burn usually fairly short periods of time and they just they are pointed up. They're not guided or anything. In order to reach orbit, to balance the fact that your fuel's running out really fast and you have to get all this velocity, you have to what's called, go what's called a uh, orbital insertion trajectory. And that's very different than just these little parabolas that you get when you go up. And so in order to do that, you have to steer. And this is sort of the central problem with rocket science, for, for complicated rocket science. Um, you gotta imagine you have this big um, tube and it's burning and just, you know, 100,000 pounds of thrust on the end, it's basically balanced. And you have to have some little computer on there that can balance it and steer it in just the right 
way so that it goes up and over at the right time to get into orbit and uses its fuel up um, not too fast and not too slow. And so how do you steer a rocket? The key piece of uh, equipment is called an IMU, or Inertial Measurement Unit. And I'll end up talking a lot about those. Basically, imagine if you're shut up in a little box in the backseat of a car and someone was driving you around. You can't see anything out. It's like, just like a computer chip doesn't have eyes or brains or any sort of sense of navigation. But what you can do is, you know, a car swerves to the right, you can feel it. You get tumbled around in the box, you can feel it speed up. And if you were really good and you kept count, like, oh, we sped up a little, you guess how fast we're going, okay, now we're probably going 30, and you count for how long and you feel when the turns are, you could actually work out where the car was going. And this is the entire idea behind inertial measurement. And it's been done, actually, it was dead reckoning in ocean faring. Uh, peoples back to prehistory all the way up to modern navies and then bar all that was borrowed for rockets and uh, we have very particular instruments the, uh, gyroscopes and accelerometers that do the same thing they're a little box they're not sentient they can't actually see outside the rocket but they can feel very precisely how much the rocket moves in any particular direction and it counts backwards and sees where you are the problem is a really good IMU one that works for real and could do, say, a space shuttle or that Ares X-1, mm, probably a few million dollars or something like that, maybe a couple hundred thousand. And it's military technology, technically. There's lots of reasons you can't get them easily or sell them or you can't share them. And uh, we're really into sharing things. So that's sort of where we came in. We're like, well, could you actually do this? You know, now we have like Arduinos and stuff. Like, can you really just take some parts off the shelf and fly a rocket and do this kind of measurement? Um, so. A uh, bunch of kids, basically, uh, at Portland State uh, a few years ago, or actually, what was it, 1997, I think, got together and thought, man, our labs are really boring. They never blow up. They don't go into space. Nothing like that. So they decided to start building rockets. So in the past decade or so, we've really come a long way and learned a lot of really interesting things. And we've been sticking to this whole goal of being open source, open hardware the whole way. So. Uh, everything I'm sharing with you, I mean, we give talks every once in a while. You can go down to PSU tonight, actually. There's a meeting every seven on or every Tuesday at 7. Um, all of our data is online. Everything we've designed, the CAD files for all of our designs are all available. And everything's in source control, and you can look at it. Um, we've launched a number of rockets over the years. This is an idea for scale um, for you. This most recent one here, the earliest one here, they're pretty big. They're like 12 feet tall this big around. Um, so they're, they're a lot of fun, they're loud. So a little bit of history. We, these are the guys that started out. Um, they basically bought a kit and put it together, went about a thousand feet or so. Um, they had a lot of fun. They put this uh, in the nose cone, they stuffed a bunch of custom electronics in. That's where they first got their taste of putting computers in, into rockets, except in this case, it was really just a video transmitter and a camera. Um, but it was a really good introduction to rocketry. And also, our ground station was pretty awesome. It was the back of a Subaru, um, but very cool. So a few years later, into the turn of into the millennium, um, we have our next launch vehicle, LV-1. We just number them, LV-0, LV-1, LV-2. And this was actually custom built. Uh, we used carbon fiber and aluminum and uh, thought we were really cool. We built our own. Uh, extendable launch tower that was an old hydraulic lift thing and um, so we could carry it around and we could pop it all out and that would be the whole tower. Um, this went to closer to 10,000 feet on uh, big commercial motors and uh, we actually put a little microcontroller in it, an 8-bit um, wrist <coughs> microcontroller, I think it was a PIC 16 something or other and uh, we had an early kind of IMU, it was parts bought off of like DigiKey and the kind of sites that you can just go to and, and get consumer electronics, and they're cheap little accelerometers, cheap little gyros. They don't work very well, um, but it was a great try. And we learned a lot. Oh, and by this point, we're now looking more like this. We've got tents and antennas and cameras, and a bit more serious. Um, so, a couple of our early launches actually were pretty awesome. I've got some video of them, and sorry that the sound probably isn't very loud. This was LV1. In Oregon, I think. Yeah. Up 
This is one of our better videos from the ground, actually, because what always happens is people are zoomed in a little, and it goes off, and it's really fast when it goes off, and immediately lose it in the sky, because it, it just disappears. It's um, really cool. And of course, we had video on the rocket. So this one was rather clever. For some reason, we haven't done this again. What we're actually looking at this framing here is um, part of a structure holding a mirror. And so the camera's actually pointed straight up, and the mirror lets you watch the ground. And then when the parachute's open, the rocket's facing downward, and we pop the mirror off. And it's on a line, so it doesn't come falling from 10,000 feet. So this is what it looks like if you were to ride one. So in all our computers here, they're just measuring what's happening on the rocket. There's no sense of control, which is actually a, a, an entire separate field. Uh, Rocketeers always divided up between guidance, knowing where you're going, navigation, the IMU part, and then control, which is the steering. And they're like entirely separate fields with their own journals and everything. What's the altitude on that? I think this was 11,000 feet. So you're in a second, the mirror will pop off. Ah, there you go. Um, so I'm pretty sure this was launched in Brothers, Oregon, which is population nine. It is um, just a little cross section on Highway 20, about an hour or so east. No, not quite even an hour east of Ben. Um, this is where we still launch, and a lot of other amateur rocket shoe people in uh, Oregon and around the Northwest come to launch. So. By this point, it's getting a bit more modern. So for the next few years, we designed our next generation vehicle. This was going to be really awesome. Uh, we flew some flights at 20,000 feet now, so we're going up a whole other order. We designed this flame, frame to be even better. It should do 50,000 feet. It should really do 100,000 feet. Um, and now we said, okay, we learned that 8-bit microcontrollers <coughs> can't do it. This is like 8-bit microcontrollers are like you know an Atari, basically, or not even that. And so you really need real computing power to do the data fusion necessary for actual control and guidance systems. So we got a grant from IBM. We put a uh, 400 megahertz PowerPC computer running Linux, the real-time kernel, um, the next up generation of what we could afford in accelerometers and gyros. Uh, we built all the software ourselves, and mostly in C. We had ground software all written in Java. It was very cool. Um, and we had a lot more work on antennas and telemetry and everything. We did have some issues, though. We lost a couple of vehicles. So um, there's a couple of big failures. Um, the main thing we learned, though, that is uh, 8 bits isn't enough. You, you really need real computers to do this. And um, we had a, a loss of a vehicle once. We don't like to talk about where there's some manufacturing issues, actually a mechanical problem, getting the fins to fit perfectly on the rocket and getting off all this stuff. Uh, a launch that was the most spectacular loss for us it was actually pretty detrimental. It was in 2005. We had the full computer on there, all this crazy stuff, electronics, it was, it was really worth a lot, and we sunk a couple years of time into it. And the gunpowder that pops <laughs> open the chutes didn't work. And as usual, when you when something doesn't work in rocket science, you learn something about it. And it turns out gunpowder burns differently at different altitudes. It has nothing to do with oxygen and everything to do with air pressure and the thermal conductivity of air at different uh, heights and moisture contents and everything. But at any rate, so without parachutes, the rocket's still in this nice, slender, perfect shape and it comes just straight back down. And uh, we actually have telemetry from those ones. We had the computer, we had antennas, we had everything. And so our, the very last data packet was of the rocket, pointed down, going about 80% the speed of sound, still accelerating slightly, about 10 feet off the ground. And uh, this tube here was all that's left of that 12-foot rocket, and we walked out to the last known coordinates of it. Um, and the rest of it's like six, <coughs> six feet underground in the hard-packed desert. Um, so. Nothing happened for a while after that, but we, there's a lot of wins in the early part of the program. We, we were able to make cheap IMUs. It didn't quite work, but we got the idea. Um, it turns out that Linux and the whole open source philosophy works really well for this kind of thing, especially for the software. Hardware is still coming along, but um, you know you can do it. You can learn about it. You can get help from other people. You can share it. Uh, we flew a desktop computer. We had a 4 megahertz power PC in 2005, and that's like an iMac, basically, uh, on a rocket. Uh, that's a lot of power, and um, our, one of our biggest things is antenna systems. These are called cylindrical patch antennas. We looked around. They use these on missiles sometimes, and you can buy them basically uh, pre-engineered for, I don't know, I think the number that someone said was like $20,000 to design really good patch antennas based off missile systems. 
Um, but we want to be able to do things off the shelf and cheaply and reproducibly. And so we figured out how to build them ourselves. The main thing is designing these little traces that are the feed horns into the, the actual antenna, which is really just a strip of, of copper. Um, so we figured all that out, and it turns out it works really well. We were able to use Wi-Fi. We went down the street to Fry's and got a little laptop PCI wireless card and put it through um, a one amp power um, amplifier, which you can do because 802.11 and channel one overlaps with an amateur band. So as long as you tag it with uh, your FCC you know, amateur ham radio license, you can do anything you want in that band as long as you don't interfere with somebody else who has a license, which basically no one does. So we just upped the power and through these antennas, which work well for rockets and our TrackMaster 2000 ground station, uh, we were able to track the whole flight and only drop three or four packets over the entire flight of the rocket up to 20,000 feet on the laptop wireless card. Um, and we also proved out a bunch of our manufacturing techniques just in a garage making carbon fiber, making um, aluminum stuff. So like I said, nothing really happened for a few years. Uh, it was a pretty disheartening loss, but uh, we finally got our, our game going back around 2009. We rebuilt the rocket. We had this beautiful flight. Um, it was a test flight. It didn't have anything expensive on it. it. had a little cheap commercial board that would open the parachutes. We spent a lot of time testing the parachutes. We were pretty sure those work now. We learned a lot of interesting lessons from that. Um, but the interesting thing was when it flew, we noticed a new problem that was looked like a lot more fun to solve. But here, I'll show you some pictures of the launch, which was really nice, or some video. <coughs> this is what it looks like from the flight line where we hit the button to launch it. You really see how fast it is and how everyone loses it immediately. I'll play that again. It's kind of short. How many G's is that pulling? Uh, it's about 10. There's a standard um, set of rules for lambda rocketry, and basically the based on the power of the engine. So this was flying in. N. If you remember the little letter codes when you could buy the little tiny cardboard rockets, it's like the little A ones up to the Ds. So the amount of energy doubles in each letter. So you imagine doubling and doubling and doubling. It's logarithmic. So this was an N, which is pretty big. Um, we also got some really awesome footage from up on the hill. This is about a mile away. And so this is the desert stretching out above us. We're on the flight line, which is off the up here. This is an abandoned shed. Um, this lighter green area is a patch that had uh, was devoid of the regular stuff and had grown some grass. And so the rock is right in the middle there. And what's really great about this is the sound. I don't know if you can hear it because the far enough away, the speed of sound delay is kind of fun. So even cooler, um, high-speed cameras have come down a lot in price. There's actually a consumer-grade <coughs> one that will do 600 frames per second. And so we pointed that. So you, so you saw how fast this is in real time. This is what it looks like about, oh, I can't do math, 1 30th, I think, real-time speed. So that's actually the engine building up chamber pressure as the, the materials start to burn solid rocket fuel. So that's pretty cool. So as usual, we had an um, onboard camera. And this is where we noticed our uh, problem, so to speak. Oh, this is the whole video, maybe? No, OK. That was setting up, um, turning on and off the switches just before launch. It was pretty funny. And doing our last minute preps. We only have a couple people up at the pad as we put the motor in and then they run away basically. In fact, it says that in our thing. Okay, there we go. So you see that spin that's incredibly dizzying. What happened was the fans were ever so slightly misaligned. And it's not a big deal. It doesn't hurt anything. There's no real moving parts on the rocket anyway. Um, the problem is, well, it makes kind of an ugly video and it gives us something to do. So we said, well, can we control the roll? What we've been trying to do this whole time is get to orbit, right? And so in order to control, you have to do all, we were just doing IMUs. We were just seeing if we could even measure where the rocket went. And the next step is to try to control it. So I said, well, let's go on the next step. Let's take baby steps. 
let's just put some fins on there that can swivel and give the rocket a little spin back and forth. And so if the rocket starts to spin up, we'll counter it out with the fins and, and it should just go straight up. Um, and that's actually called stabilization, not control. Um, so we upped it a little bit more. I said, well, if we can do stabilization, we should be able to do control. So better than that, we decided to make program rolls. We will send the rocket up, we'll have it go straight, and we'll have it turn 90 degrees, then turn back 180, and then keep turning 90 degrees and pausing until it runs out of airspeed and the parachute's open. So in fairly short order, we had come up with a plan. Um, we'd use what are usually called canards. They're small fins up towards the front of the rocket. In this case, we kept them around the center of gravity. Um, and we wanted to actually point the rocket. And we came up with the design all in, in software and CAD, which is really interesting. So we worked out all the linkages here and how much power we need for the motor and what the gear down ratio was and all this kind of stuff. And then we built it, and mostly with CNC machines. And it turned out really awesome. It looks beautiful, it looks even better, and then and when it's running, and then we launched it again. So now you can see here are the canards. Here are the static fins, we call them now. They're, they're bolted to the frame, as usual. And they may still be slightly misaligned, but this is supposed to correct for it and do the program. So this was this summer, in June. Hopefully. Well, that's exciting. Here we go. The interesting thing to note is it didn't go still. And it's turning back and forth, but this is not at all what was supposed to happen. Um, it's out of control at this point. It's turning, and it was supposed to stop at some point, and it was supposed to turn 90 degrees to stop. It's just turning, sometimes faster and slower. The fins are moving, so that was interesting. We learned that from the video. Well, there, it finally reverses, but it was supposed to do that ages ago. It didn't work at all. Again, rocket science is hard. But the cool thing is it didn't work for a really interesting reason. It gets into some crazy aerodynamics. So it turns out, when you have little canards like this, the air rushes past them. To create lift, they tilt a little bit into the wind. They call it an angle of attack. And they actually form a vortex of air off one leading edge of them. And that vortex continues to exist. I mean, you've added energy to this piece of air, and now it doesn't just disappear. So it streams off like little streamers at the end of the wing. It's called vortex shedding, which is all well and good. It's how wings usually work. The problem is they went straight down the airframe and hit these big fins and created a force in the opposite direction that you're intending. And so if you look really carefully on the watch video, when, well, let's see if I can get a little further back. When the rocket's like this, the fins are pointing such a way you would expect the rocket to be spinning, let's see, around this way. Right, because the, you know, if you just look at it naively, and it turns out the rocket's spinning entirely the other direction. So physically, the entire control system was reversed because of some crazy thing of, that air does to fins and canards and vortex shedding. We never would have really guessed this. We there was a lot of unknowns in this launch. It was the first time trying to do control, but this was just wild. Um, luckily, we read up on this. Now that we knew what to look for. Why do canards not work? Um, Missiles, early missile designs have the exact same problem. There's a couple ways to fix it. And one of them that was extremely crazy was uh, called, uh, or was a, a rolling um, fin. What are they called? The free, free spin and fin. So you take the whole fin canister, you take it off, you put a giant bearing around it, you put it back on the rocket so that the fins of the back of the rocket can just spin as much as they want. And so what's going on here, you're actually decoupling axes, you would call it. So they'll still steer the rocket straight up instead of off to the side because there's fins at the bottom and not at the top, and so it's kind of stable like a dart. But when the little vortexes or actually anything else tries to spin the whole rocket and its roll axis, instead it'll just spin up the fins on the bearing and the rest of the rocket will stay still. And we big bearings like that are hard to come by. We realized we could just build these. And so uh, that went, you know, there I just made three months of work sound like nothing, right? So we figured out how to build big bearings. Um, basically, it still looks like this. So we designed it in CAD again. There's the trace, uh, races with the little balls in them. And we machined them out of really good machine steel. This is just in Dan's workshop. So here's the fins. And look, you can just spin the fin can around. We did another little subtle trick after talking to some people. There's only three static fins. 
but four can art still, so that at no one po at no one point can all of the vortices interact with all four fins. They're never aligned perfectly because there's three and four. There's a an offset. So, uh, just a few months later in October, we tried again. Only now we've got the three static fins, and they're on the the decoupled roll axis. And this is what we ended up with. Unless this one won't play either, in which case I'll be angry. All right, fine. The beeping is from the, the onboard computers going through their test cycles and saying, hey, I'm ready to fly and all that. So now we stay straight. And there the fins turn up. Now we do our first 90 degree turn. Hold it. Back 180. Hold it. 90. 90. 90. So the fin just get larger as you slow down, which is what should happen. And then we run out of airspeed, so the fins are no longer effective, which is okay, because we're right at apogee there when the chutes come out. Chutes open better this time, too. So it actually worked. We learned something that worked, which is the best possible outcome. If we had just worked the first time, it would have been no fun whatsoever. And uh, yeah, that was just a few months ago. And now we're sitting around going, well, great, what do we do? Um, and there's been lots of talk. The next thing to do is split the fins up. So instead of being in a spin, it's, it's full roll, axis, tilt, whatever. We can steer a rocket to a point in the sky. That unfortunately scares governments. And it's questionable whether or not we're allowed to be open source at that point. So if anyone remembers the cryptography wars of open source and whether or not they applied to ITAR, we're in the same space, only we are actually kind of building missiles. Um, we don't use the M word around there. They're, they're really not missiles. They turn out to be really bad for doing anything uh, unsavory because right now, at least, the rocket's pretty small. The design target is actually one kilogram for space. Is one kilogram of, of just about anything really isn't a whole lot. And uh, I think one of our guys said it best when uh, he said, if you're building a car bomb, you don't build an F1 racer to put the car bomb in. You, you, you go buy a junk car and you just throw it in there. So this, in our minds, is not an issue, but it doesn't matter because laws are laws whether you agree with them or not. And we have really most of the relevant lawyers in the Pacific Northwest looking at this for us. And we might just have to go straight to the State Department and make an appeal at some point. Um, so in the meantime, we're sort of toying around with other ideas like building liquid-fueled engines, which is really cool. Right now, all of our motors we literally buy online. Um, there's some certification-type stuff you have to do and a few other hoops to jump through. It's really pretty easy to get big rocket motors. They won't get you to space, though. So at some point, we have to think about that. So there's a lot of open future. And right now, we're, we don't know what we're going to do. <laughs> and we, who knows? I'll have to come back and tell you when we figure it out. Um, but you guys can come visit anytime in the 4th Avenue building at PSU, Tuesday nights at 7. And we try to let people know through our Twitter account, PEX Aerospace, and through the website when launches are coming up, and, and we're in Brothers. And uh, yeah, so that's the story of rocket science in Portland. <laughs> questions? Uh, I have a couple of questions. Sure. Um, why do you think that there, I noticed that there are very few um, views on those YouTube videos. Mm -hmm. Why do you think so that there were so few views? Like one of them had like 500 views and the other like not even 30. Yeah. Um, some of the videos are fairly new. Uh -huh. There's one that I posted last night because I wanted to put it on this. Uh, there's most of them. It's just that we don't have any kind of uh, marketing of any type or stretch of the, that word. I mean, we just don't. We don't advertise at all to people. We, we tell our friends, the people in the group, there's just not enough of us that know enough people. Um, I mean, I tweet links to it every once in a while and get a couple of views. It's just, that's all that's seen it. We, we're too busy building rockets. We would love actually to have kind of a strategy around that and a better website and a part that was more clear what we were doing and explanations and something to promote what we're doing and get people interested. And, but we're too busy building rockets. <laughs> um, you know, there's just a few of us that are put a lot of time to the group because it is all volunteer, and 
uh, I think it's the same problem a lot of small nonprofit type things have, which is how do you market yourself if you don't have any marketing people, and if you're too busy doing what you're doing. Things like DARPA, contacted you? Um, you know, not. I don't think anyone's really contacted us. Um, we've had a couple talks with the State Department and with the lawyers recently on the various things we're doing. Everything we do is fine so far. We have a couple people get in touch with us every once in a while. It never seems to turn into anything. Um, more recently, we're sort of talking about working with aerospace companies and lending our expertise and hopefully getting some back. And we're still seeing how that's going. We've talked to a couple people. Some people won't return emails. Other people are interested. It's just, it's, it's a big mix. Um, not We're not really well-known or anything at all, so we don't have high-level view like that. We don't get people calling us. Yeah. Are those, um, I like, I did like a, a gap when I was really young. Yeah. Kid. Are those rocket kits still available? Like, oh, yeah. Do you have to still buy them off the shelf and stuff? You can buy them at any reasonable hobby store that still sells rocket things. Um, I went to a couple where recently didn't have anything space related whatsoever. Okay. Lots of road control cars. That was entirely lame. Tammy's Hobbies in Beaverton is awesome. Okay. And they have lots of rocket stuff. Yeah, they have lots of everything cool. stuff, but they have rocket stuff too. In fact, we get parts for our rocket from them sometimes. So. Yeah. Are, yeah. Are there uh, other? I'm guessing there are other groups throughout the country that are doing similar things. What's the network like between uh, various groups? We're not good at that either. I've been trying to understand more about the uh, ecology of rocket groups. It's hard to say. Most people don't post a lot of stuff. They all have the same problem we do. That they're all busy in their workshops and they don't do a lot of posting and advertising so it's really hard to find. I mean you start searching for things and you find pages that go to dead links or GeoCities pages that don't exist anymore and that kind of thing. So they may still be active, who knows? We didn't update the front page of our website for like six months once, we weren't, we were just busy. So I don't know, there's a couple other college groups, there's a few in California, it's a little, a little easier to know the ones on the west coast because we do actually occasionally run into them at rocket launches. Um, there's a really cool group at University of Southern California, but there's no one doing active guidance type stuff like this that I know of, except one group in Finland. So there, there, isn't, there isn't probably a sense of competition between these groups? Not really. For, for exploration? I mean, we think it'd be cool if we were first to do anything, but it's hard to even know who's first, so there's, it's not, um, there's not really any sense of competition, no. Yeah, so far I haven't seen really successful problem solving over the internet. There's a couple big groups to look for, which one is Team Frednet, which is a Google Lunar Landing X Prize competitor. Uh, in the next, was it three years, I think? They're supposed to land a small robot on the moon um, by borrowing someone else's rocket, actually, is the way that they're all doing it. Um, and they're open source collaborative group that basically only exists on the internet. And I mean, we'll see if they're successful or not. It's a little hard to tell how they're doing as well. There's another group started up called Sea Start, um, which is really just a forum of people who want to build big rockets. And I don't think they've managed to actually glue together two pieces of anything yet. It's only been about a year, but um, it's really hard to say how well that works over the internet because it's hard for us to do things even over email lists and stuff. We usually have to get our heads together because um, it's, it's hard engineering and so you really need very fast feedback. You need something like Twitter, but long form and with CAD files. I mean, it, it's kind of tough to do over long. I'm a bit of a pessimist there, probably, but um, I just haven't seen it done well yet. I bet if it's done well, it could be, or there's improvements to be made in that, definitely. There, there isn't a big sense of community in this kind of bleeding edge experimental stuff. There's a good community around people who launch rockets for fun that don't have guidance and don't have computers on them, but it's hard to tell who's serious about putting computers on them. So your target is one kilogram. Mm -hmm. If you, what would you put in there? Basically, a radio repeater and a webcam. Okay. And they had solar panels and antennas. Like yeah. No, no, no. Actually, I, I think the usual rocket biological rocketry forbid putting vertebrates on rockets. 
It's actually explicitly stated. <laughs> we could do cheese, yes. SpaceX did cheese, we could do cheese. Um, yeah, it would be, and it's actually kind of cool. We, we could get tons of free work out of this because the ham radio community is still fairly active. It's just smaller than it was in the past. There's people all over the world who love bouncing stuff off of ham sats. And so if we were to put up a little radio repeater <coughs> with the webcam pulling off telemetry and data and, and just say to the, the whole ham world, there's this thing that's going to come overhead. You guys should listen for it. And if you hear something, drop us an email like where you were and what the, the packets were off of it. And you, there's tons of people around the world who think that's the coolest thing ever. Because it would be, if we were able to put a kilogram in orbit, this would be the first time anything other than a multi-billion dollar corporation and or a government has ever done it. So for a bunch of kids up in the Northwest. I mean, that would be huge. So we'd get big press attention for that. And so everyone would be listening for it all around. So we could get Do all you think ultimately that's, that's your goal? That's our stated goal. Um, I say that that gives us a vision statement, something that aims towards. I don't know how practical it is because... It really is crazy. I mean, the whole, just to do the navigation and control is really hard, much less building a rocket that can sustain the energies and powers needed to get to Mach 23. I mean, it's, it's a bit crazy, but it is doable. Um, our main sort of mascot is uh, the Lambda 4S, which is a really early rocket from the Japanese space program. It was all solid fueled. It was basically old scrapped together missiles um, with big solid rockets on the end, which aren't any different than the ones you buy like at hobby stores. Um, they're just bigger. And it had, you know, it's like 1970, so it had an actual I'm using physical gyroscopes and that kind of thing, which means it weighed like 100 pounds just for the computer that measured the, the angle it was going at and all that kind of stuff. And um, it actually made it a space for more than a kilogram, for like 100 kilograms or something like that. Maybe 10, I forget. Uh, really crazy. And they did it, you know, it's 1970s technology, and it's 2011. I mean, this stuff should weigh an ounce. It should weigh five grams, the entire computer, I knew everything. It doesn't even need to weigh a kilogram. The kilograms mostly the aluminum around it and some solar panels. So there's no, it seems like you should be able to do it. It's, it's just hard. You just have to build a rocket that's not going to tear itself to pieces getting to orbit. And then you have to actually figure out all the control system stuff, which is, like I said, its own uh, thing with journals and everything. But you get a degree in control systems if you want to. Mostly testing, uh, we take a lot of information from old, from the, the people who do rockets for fun, the amateur rocket tree community that just bolts stuff together and flies it. Uh, we were in the desert this um, fall actually watching some at an event called Balls. It was Balls 18, I think, this year. And um, maybe only half the rockets really worked. But there's, a lot, there's an enormous body of information out there about building rockets of that size from those type of people. They basically, and you just read how they did it on the successful ones. And um, you can also skim stuff out of old missile design books from the 50s at Palace Technical and stuff like that. There's, there's tons of information out there. That's the other reason that we're not really in that section where we have to be worried about ITAR and, and arms treaties and all this stuff is because everything we're doing is out of like textbooks so far up to maybe the role control. Um, once we get that one step further, it'll be different, but you can read everything about how to build rockets out of books. And we're following their advice and we're reading the things. We're not doing anything new. We haven't designed anything that's secret. We're just, I mean, it's publicly available information. It's, it's Wikipedia for like probably 90% of it, really. And then fact-checked <laughs> before you fly it. And then, like I said, we make mistakes ourselves. That's how we learn a lot of this stuff. The, the whole gunpowder thing about having to actually hermetically seal gunpowder casing or cartridges for ejection charges is just a trial and error thing. So yeah. yeah. So you were talking in the beginning about inertial guidance that you have to mm -hmm. measure kind of where you've been mm -hmm. uh, by summing all the right. instantaneous measurements. So probably accelerometers are part of that. I don't know if yep. gyroscopes. Yep. Well, are, well they're called rate gyros. This I I'm never clear about that. There's there's two kinds of gyros, but yes, there's gyro So why why are you know they have ones that are extremely expensive and and what's the limiting factor in, in the cheap ones? Either you know sensitivity is there a you know a, a sensitivity spec or is it how fast you can read them or is it noise or is it? It's well, it's really all of those things. For the gyroscope, the gyroscopes are the best example because the expense factor there is what they're made of, like the technology they run on. 
So the, the really, really, really good thing, the thing you want that all the professionals use that's impossible to get is called a laser ring gyro. And it works on this really crazy principle of this little tiny laser and a cavity and uh, the whole cavity lases at once. And if it's not rotating, the, the actual waveforms line up in constructive interference. And, and so this is all like really, really precision machined optical stuff. One of a time, or one of a kind type deals off optical benches. Well, small manufacturer maybe. What time? Well, they range. There's some the size of this room that are used for research for the rotation of the earth. And there's some the size of probably a stack of cards here for missiles and things. Um, but they're nearly impossible to get your hands on. <coughs> what you actually buy of, of SparkFun are MIMS, some micro large molecules, and so they're etched, and they do all kinds of little tricks. I think the main one has a mass that's on a spring. There's a bunch of capacitive fingers, and so basically they don't actually touch, and they form a giant capacitor. And the equation for capacitance depends on the amount of space between two plates. And so because these fingers, this is a huge surface area, and so the tiniest movement of the little mass in the middle changes the capacitance of the fingers. You can measure that off a little piece of circuitry. And what they do is they actually oscillate the mass in one direction, and if you try to rotate it in the non, not in the way that it's oscillating, so if it's oscillating this way and you try to spin it this way, it'll resist that and it will do a weird little figurine. And then you try to stop it from doing that by measuring off this, and so it's all this whole thing. The problem is it just, it's not perfect. It doesn't work very well, really. Um, the limits of how well you can machine it, the limits of the um, actual components that you use, and the analog circuitry involved to do the feedback and all that stuff contributes to what the sensitivity is and what the noise floors are. And you need really low noise floors and really good sensitivity and a high dynamic range to do rockets. And, you know, it's like pick any two kind of thing, and it's just hard to get them to work well. I think it's the same thing for accelerometers, except they've been MIMS for a long time. I don't know what the really professional ones are off the top of my head. Um, but they're just better. They definitely are faster. Speed does have a lot to do with it. Um, much, much higher quality, lower noise components in all the amps and all the feedback circuitry. Because um, for all of these measurement devices, you take something and you try to hold it in a particular position and you measure how hard it is or how hard you're having to hold it. You don't actually measure the movement of it. Um, that's a little trick, engineering, or electrical engineering trick. And um, so that involves a tiny bit of analog circuitry with amps and feedback that's a lot of noise in that process as well. So it's doing that well that seems to be the expensive part. Because again, fundamentally it's simple, but in practice it's hard. Um, and you're at the mercy of chip manufacturers also. I have a feeling that there's a lot of things they could do better, but they don't because there's not a market for it. And now with cell phones with accelerometers, there is a market for it, and that's the main reason they've all come down in price and gone up in sensitivity. There's not a big change in the way that they do them. Except for gyros. Like I said, gyros are different because there's about 20 different ways to build gyros. And the MIMS one kind of suck, but they're better than the old Pisa ones from a few years ago. They're already two orders of magnitude better, so. Um, there's this great curve. They really, the sensitivity just gets better and better. The price goes down and down. So we kind of just have to play the waiting game, I think. And we're getting close because we can update our states with GPS. Um, I didn't mention GPS at all. That's a whole other issue. GPS kind of doesn't work for rockets. It's not fast enough and it could always drop out at any time and then you're completely hosed. So what you do is you use GPS as part of the equation for building up the idea of where you are in the computer's mind. Um, and you, you use accelerometers in between. And so as you start to drift off where you think you are and where you really are, you can use the GPS to bring you back in every once in a while. Um, and so even with bad accelerometers, you can correct that every few seconds with a GPS reading and do this kind of loopy thing and then draw a nice uh, line through it. That's all data synthesis part. That's part of the controls algorithm problem. So um, the the real answer is always we use everything that we can all thrown together. And um, but the cheaper and better we stuff we can get, the easier it is to do that. I have just one more. Sure. Well, let's say you get something into space. Yeah. Um, we haven't looked into any of that yet because we haven't been lucky enough to have that problem. <laughs> but I have a feeling, you know, the Earth is 75% water, and totally, but, I mean, one kilogram shouldn't be an issue. We'll have to do the yeah. math. Oh, so, yeah. We haven't done the math. There is actually a possibility of even maybe recovering it because that's a newer thing in aerospace science the last 
five years or so is making what are called Valutes, which are inflatable um, heat shields, basically. They're like Kevlar inflatables. And they slow you down on the upper atmosphere um, where it's still really thin, so they don't create the same amount of heat that a heavier object would. And you can actually recover small things from orbit. That would be a really cool project, but so I'm just kidding. Yeah, well, I, I, I'm pretty sure, and again, I haven't done the math, I'm pretty sure if we just let it go and didn't care, nothing would even survive to the surface. Oh, gotcha. Coming back through. Yeah. That's the 90% likelihood. The 10% of it, maybe it does, is the Earth is 75% water. <laughs> and on top of that, I mean, some, I forget, ridiculous number of tons of material hits the Earth and falls to the surface every year. Oh, yeah. And only one person has been hit in, like, recorded history. So it, it's really not... The kind of thing, bizarre. you know, <laughs> this happens five times a day and it's never caused a problem in a million years, so we're not actually worried, but we haven't really done the math yet. We'll worry about that when we get to it. We will worry about it, don't worry, we'll just give you a chance. But we'll make sure we have a justifiable reason for whatever we do. Thanks everybody for attending. Um, the next meeting commences on January 25th at 6 p.m. with our speaker Coco Erhausen Martinez of Coco Cardenas, who will be demonstrating her jewelry making process. Coco produces molds for each design. The molds and castings are made from silicone rubbers and urethane plastics, giving her a flexible, careful control of each piece. The original designs are made from wood and wax carvings or by the manip manipulation of previously assembled pieces. Coco has worked on specialty pieces for cream Screaming Mimi's in New York City and Mini Market in Brooklyn. She's also worked with Patty Wilson on custom pieces for photo shoots. Recently, she has done jewelry and handbag, handbags for Adam Arnold's last runway show in the fall of 2010. Thank you. Cool. Thanks,